Hello, and welcome back to When America Had Talent. This is uh, going to be exclusively about George Burns. And um, it's just going to be random clips and stories, and it's not going to be laugh out loud hilarious, but he's very amusing and he's, he's funny. He's got a natural gift, and he's got the glasses and the look. And he lasted for 100 years, something like 96 years in the business. He was the oldest show on Earth at one point. <laughs> America. Fairy tales can come true. What can happen to you if you're young at heart? His is the longest-running act in show business. A, news, a newspaper woman called me up the other day. <clears throat> she says, Mr. Burns, is it true that you still go out with young girls? I says, true. She says, is it true that you smoke 15 and 20 cigars a day? I says, true. Is it true that you drink three and four martinis a day? I says, true. She said, what does your doctor say? I said, he's dead. George Burns has made it to a very old age the same way he made it through a very long career. He's never stopped working. When I started, I had no talent. I worked with a seal. I worked with a dog. I did a skating act. Burns started on the vaudeville stage, but nothing really worked until he met a jobless 17-year-old named Gracie. Gracie Allen. We had the grandest time. She gave definition to the word ditzy. Could you eat two big lamb chops alone? Alone? Oh, no, not alone. With potatoes, I could. You could? And Burns and Allen became household names across America, radio, films, television. Why, what beautiful flowers. Aren't they lovely? And if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have them. Me? What did I have to do with this? Well, it was your idea. You said when I went to visit Clara Bagley to take her flowers, so when she wasn't looking, George, I did. George, everybody loves a story, and George was a consummate storyteller. I came from New York City until I was 17. I thought to milk the cow, you had to throw it on its back so the cream would come to the top. <laughs> we didn't have any trees or grass in that neighborhood. The only green things we ever saw were the tops of pool tables. <laughs> Of course, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get the milk wouldn't be new to me. I did that when I was a kid. Always got up at 4 to take the milk in off the front doorstep. I had to, if not our neighbor who was paying for it would beat me to it. Oh, I think he was a bloody genius. I do. And you know why, Larry? Because he had dyslexia. That's my theory. And he couldn't, he had to follow his animal instinct. He had dyslexia. He, he had dyslexia, and he had uh, uh, people read him books and all that, and yet he wrote seven books. So you sit down with a writer? You just sit and talk, talk. Just talk, like then, we're talking now. And then he puts it all he together. He puts it all together, and he makes it sound like I'm, I'm writing it. I can't, I can't spell. I, I only went to the fourth grade in school. When I was eight years old, I was in show business. I was singing with the Pee Wee Quartet. I How could you get out of school in the fourth grade? Played hooky. But, I mean, didn't they, didn't they come get you, didn't they? No, go? they were glad I, I, slept, I left school. See, I read in the paper that Crusoe used to uh, eat a, uh, a lot of garlic. It made, it made his voice sing. I want to be a singer, so I ate garlic. So when I played hooky from school, my teacher uh, wrote a letter of thanks to my mother. <laughs> it, he had to go on feelings, animal instinct. And I said, George, are you aware of your sex appeal? He said, oh, yeah, I feel it. I said, do you know that it's great? <laughs> oh, yeah. And those, oh, yeah, those girls, those young girls run down the center aisle, and they want a hug, and they want a kiss. And he said, uh, yeah, he said, I can feel it start. And he said, I said, why is it stronger now, George, when you're 98 at the time I asked him? And he said, because it's a surprise. People don't expect it. When your mother died, she was how old? 58. Very young. Very, very young. Was that sudden? Uh, well, yes. Well, in those days, you know, you had a bad heart. There was very little they could do about it. Like today, you can do a lot. Yeah. And um, nobody really knew how bad it was until towards the end. And he never knew. No? And so no, he was shocked at her death. It was quite a shock. And uh, it, her heart just exploded. It just, uh, it was terrible. Oh. Did How he, long were they married? 36 oh. years. Did he have a rough time handling it? Oh, yeah. Alan King, what made them a great comedy duo? Well, I know you're all talking about Gracie, and I was privileged to have met and had dinner at the home. But when I think of the great duo, forgive me, it's Benny and Burns. <laughs> Jack Benny, I never thought of Jack Benny without thinking about George or vice versa. They were, they were, it was a romance. He loved Jack 
as much, I guess, after Gracie, he just, it was Jack Benny. And I was privileged to sit with him. And what he did to Benny, <laughs> he buried him. He did things. The first thing he ever said to me, I was at Leon and Eddie's. I was 17 years old. And I was, the week before, George Jessel came in to see me. And I met with him and he said, you're the best monologist I've ever seen since Matthew Bernard. <laughs> and I was so excited. And I went to the Fries Club and I remember asking Ted Lewis and everybody, I said, tell me about Matthew Bernard. And they said, never heard of him. <laughs> and then one night, Jack and Mary and George and Gracie came in and they invited me to the table and I looked at George Burns and I said, could you tell me about Matthew Bernard. And George said, I guess you saw Jessel lately. <laughs> George told me that he went into Jack's room after Jack Benny died. Was his a sudden death? It was sudden for me. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I was there the night he died, and Mary came down. She says, Jack just died. I says, I'm going up to see him. She says, you can't come up. The doctor says that nobody can come up. I said, Mary, I know Jack Benny longer than the doctor. I'm going up. And I went up. And there was Jack Benny with his hands this way and his head on the side. He looked like he just told a joke and he's timing a laugh. And he was gone. The tribute would be complete without the appearance of his best friend, George Burns. George, of course, as you know, Jack, is known for his ability to break you up at any time. Not that it's hard to do. I see you fall down over a speech by Carl Munt. <laughs> You're welcome, please. Jack Benny's security blanket, George Burns. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and um, Jack, you're the guest of honor. If you'd like to laugh now, we'll get it over with. <laughs> Johnny Carson. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny, the name Johnny Carson. Oh, I thought you were laughing at Johnny. No, no, the name no, Johnny no. Carson, because that's a funny name. I don't even care what you say. I'm no. still laughing at Sullivan. Oh. Are you the one? Well, anyway. <laughs> um, you know, it's strange to see Johnny Carson here tonight, because I usually watch him with my clothes off. <laughs> And somehow he seems funnier with my clothes on. <laughs> Come to think of it, I'm funnier with my clothes on. <laughs> but you know, this, uh, this, uh, this sociable tonight is, 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 is for Jack Benny. He's 75 years old. Amazing, he looks absolutely good. He looks, he looks, he looks absolutely wonderful. He looks as young as Groucho Marx. <laughs> and I've got a reputation for being a comedian's comedian because I can make Jack Benny laugh, and that's not true. I don't make him laugh at all, he makes himself laugh. Like I met him at the club, I wasn't doing anything, and he started to laugh. And he knew I wasn't doing anything, but he thought I wasn't doing it on purpose. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't understand. He's the best, what, timing of all, right? Yeah, yeah. The longest joke quiet, you write. A quiet riot, Jack Benny. George was born Nathan Birnbaum in New York City on January 20th, the ninth of 12 children. He entered show business as a member of the Pee Wee Quartet in, in 1903. <laughs> he forms a comedy act with Gracie Allen in 1923. He marries her in Cleveland on January 7th, 1926. In 58, she retires. Six years later, she dies. George takes over for Benny in the Sunshine Boys, wins Best Supporting Actor Oscar. And George dies March 9th, 1996, seven weeks after his 100th birthday. In vaudeville, they, you, you, you could be canceled after the first show. I was always canceled. I played the, uh, the Folly Theater in Brooklyn. I was doing a single then. I was rehearsing my music at 10 o'clock in the morning. The manager heard me rehearse and canceled. <laughs> I'm the only act in show business that was canceled before he opened. <laughs> I'm happy to say I'm living today in these good old, in the 
this battle, in this good old battle day. <laughs> when did the singing thing start, that George was a singer? He didn't really sing. I know, he used to do well, it on radio, though, and he loved to warm up. It was like Jack Benny loved the violin. <laughs> That's true. But yeah. Jack could play the violin. Yes, that yeah, he could he do. Well, George, George could sing a little. Well, the singing, we, what was the singing? I love to sing. I used to listen to your radio show. I used to love the singing parts. Yeah, I love to Those sing. Those are my favorite parts of Well, I used to make syrup for a candy store in the, in the basement. Chocolate and vanilla and strawberry. You put it in the vat and you cook it and you put it in bottles. And three kids, we were singing, uh, making syrup. And there was a letter carrier. His name was Lou Farley on the east side. He wanted the whole world to sing harmony. He came down, he saw four kids, he told us how to sing harmony. So we're singing, we're singing pretty good. One day I look up, we, this was in the basement, look up, there's about eight or ten people standing up there, and they threw a couple of pennies. We stopped making syrup, we went into show business. We sang in yards, on ferry boats, and street cars, passed around the hats, sometimes they put something in our hats, sometimes they took our hats, you know. <laughs> Did you give the group a name? Yeah, the Pee Wee Quartet, we call us. The and what Quartet. part of the four-part harmony were you? I was the tenor. You're a tenor. A tenor. Good night, little girl, good night. I hope that you get home all right. The martinis were fine and your kisses divine, but I thought by midnight you'd surely be mine. I was wrong, little girl, I was wrong. Run along, little girl, run along. If I couldn't win you with all the gin that's in you, good night, little girl. It's not a good song. Ladies and gentlemen, with great respect and love, I give you Mr. George Byrne. Thank you, Dean, for that, for that sweet introduction. You know, you got to give Dean credit. When he has a show to do, it's amazing how he gets the job done. For instance, he's got to introduce everybody on this dais. Believe me, it's not easy. He's got to stand up to do it. <laughs> In fact, the doctor gave Dean one day to stop drinking. Dean picked January the 20th, 1999. <laughs> I know at these roasts you're supposed to say terrible things about the guest, but how can you say anything nasty about Jimmy Stewart? He's a doll. I'd even like to take him out dancing. <laughs> it's so nice I'd even let him lead. Of course, I wouldn't try it in Florida. Imagine me trying to be funny by insulting Jimmy Stewart. He's so happily married, so quiet, so gentle, so tall, so contented, so pleasant. It's not a laugh in that group. <laughs> I can't insult Jimmy Stewart, it's not my nature. I like to say nice things about everybody. I can't even insult Don Rickles. <laughs> I'm Milton Berle, I can insult. Yeah, I'd enjoy insulting Milton Berle. I think I will. Last week I ran into his wife and I said, Ruth, I know you and Milton have been married a long time. How's your sex life? She says, are you kidding? Milton gets more laughs in bed than he gets when he plays Las Vegas. <laughs> I still have another problem. What to say about Jimmy Stewart? He managed to live 50 years in Hollywood and never had his character blemished. He's a perfect citizen. Whenever there's a wild party with the booze and the girls, when Jimmy hears about it, it makes him mad because he's never invited. <laughs> I love Jimmy because he's so casual and so easygoing and he talks slow and he listens slow and he eats slow, and he walks slow, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, he does everything slow. <laughs> By the way, Jimmy was supposed to play God in the picture I did, but the only reason they took me is that the studio saved a fortune. We all know that God created the earth in six days, or well, it would have taken Jimmy at least six months. <laughs> Jimmy has been an actor all his life, but I started acting only about two and a half years ago. And Jimmy, I hope this doesn't upset you, but I found out that acting is very, very easy. 
you're doing a scene where you knock on somebody's door, and if somebody says, come in, if you walk in, you're a good actor. <laughs> if a man says, come in, and you stay out in the hall, that's bad acting. <laughs> I'm a good actor. I always walk in. <laughs> and some of the movies that they're doing today, you can even do it lying down. And you don't have to put your clothes on. But you're never embarrassed because there's always a girl next to you to talk to. <laughs> I never go to porno movies, but I'd be willing to pay five dollars just to see Jimmy Stewart with his clothes off. <laughs> I'd even pay a dollar to see him without a tie. <laughs> well, Jimmy, I'm delighted to be here. And what I said still goes. After the show, I'd still like to take you out dancing. And you're such a nice man, I promise not to dance close. No, no, no. From here down, I need makeup. <laughs> I thank you for very, that. Very, <laughs> very little, my <laughs> Now, we talked about this last time you're here. I see you out. I'll see you at Chasen's or someplace, and you're always smoking a cigar. You'll have a couple of martinis. You're out dancing with the young girls. Isn't that uh, a little dangerous, sir? Well, I asked my doctor. I went there, but he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'd, I'd, I'd drink about three or four martinis a day. I smoke between 10 and 15 cigars a day. Well, at my age, I got to hold on to something. <laughs> the audience there actually gasped when you said you smoke 15 to 20 cigars a day. I do. But are these expensive? No. Really? They, these are three for a dollar. <laughs> three for a dollar? Yeah, El Productos. Yeah. You see, a good cigar is well packed. Yeah. And a well packed cigar, when you go out on the stage and you smoke it, it keeps going out. Ah. And if it keeps going out, the audience goes out, too. <laughs> I smoke these where the audience stays. So my, my only problem is sometimes I can't get it in, in, into the holdup. I suppose and I When do. I get it in, it's exciting. <laughs> oh, I, I, can't, I can't wait to be 95, George. <laughs> enjoy some of those little things of life. Uh, yeah. I saw an article the other day about you and they called you uh, an American institution. You feel me? What does that mean? Well, it's just what it means, I guess. You know, they like pay me, I'm an institution. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I tell you, I don't believe everything I read. No. I read in the paper that spinach is bad for you. I eat everything. You know, I, I'm not a good eater. I'm not no. a good eater. If food is bad, I send for ketchup. If I go out with a girl, if I don't like her, I send for ketchup. <laughs> Last night I sent for ketchup. Oh, did you? I did, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to ask what for. <laughs> you don't have to watch your diet at all? No. I eat one good meal a day. Very little breakfast, very, very little lunch, and one good dinner. So you have a good dinner? Yeah. yeah. And the martinis are at night oh, or those oh, for yeah. lunch? When I, I go to the club. Yeah. Hillcrest. And Hillcrest. And I play... I have lunch, a very cup of soup and a cup of coffee. Then I play bridge. I play bridge today with some fellows. Right. And then my partner wears a hearing aid. I wear a hearing aid, too. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. So I said to him, your battery is dead. He says, thanks, George. You look good, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold there. Hold that thought for a moment. we got to do a commercial. We're coming back. Okay. Stay where you are. Somebody told me, or I remember this in one of your books or something, since, since vaudeville. Yeah. You've had a, uh, like a secret about performing. Or what is it? About success or... No, I was very lucky. When I started, there were places to be bad in. Ah. There's no places to be bad today. I was bad from 8 until 27. Till I, was <laughs> I did all kinds of acts. I worked for the seal. I worked for the dog. I did a skating act, Brown and Williams, singers, dancers, and roller skaters. <laughs> And if you ever work with skates, your back wheels don't turn. You dance on skates. I didn't know that. And I'm sitting in Polly Marcus's office, 
And I heard Folly Marcus say, I can use a dog guy to run Conkoma. I said, tell Folly Marcus that Brown and Williams and their dogs are sitting outside. <laughs> Gave us the contract. We went to run Conkoma. We picked up two dogs. <laughs> did our skating act, and the dogs did their act. The dogs did their act. <laughs> And it ruined our skates. That was it. <laughs> and then I met 27, I met Gracie. That's right. And that everything changed. That. With Gracie, Gracie was something. She was a good actress, wasn't she? A great, great actress. See, Gracie played a dumb dame on the stage. The whole world thought she was dumb about Gracie. Gracie thought she was smart. When Gracie said strange things and you didn't understand her, she felt sorry for you. And Gracie, <laughs> and Gracie never told a joke. She explained it to you. Like I came home one night, I said, what are we having for dinner? She said, ro 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 roast beef. I, I, I just put two roasts in the oven, a big one and a little one. I said, why two? She said, why? When the little one burns, that means the big one's done. <laughs> Perfect logic. Splendid. <clears throat> Marvelous logic. Yeah. You, uh, you were famous for playing uh, jokes on Jack Benny. Um, you could break Jack well, up. Didn't you send Mary once in a... In a Expensive purse or something is a joke? Well, Jack, Jack Benny, uh, if you told Jack Benny a joke, you wouldn't laugh. But some little trifle, a little incident. Like, um, I was sitting with Jack Benny at the club. And he started to laugh. I says, I'm not saying anything. He says, I know, but you're not saying it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I came to his house. He had about 150 people. There was a party. And he said to me, George, he says, the party's not moving. It's not moving. I said, Jack, the party is moving. Everybody's drinking. We're all smoking. We're all talking. He says, look, George, I'm in show business, too. I know when the party moves. This party is not moving. So kidding, I said, if you want to make it move, go upstairs. Come down in your shorts, in your underwear, with Mary's hat, and play the violin. That'll make it move. And he said, you think so? I was kidding. He said, sure. I said, okay, I'll do it. So he went upstairs. So I said to everybody, Jack is coming down on his shorts with a violin. Don't, don't pay any attention. <laughs> So Jack, Jack came down in the shorts with the violin. Nobody looked at him. <laughs> so he fell down and started to laugh. He says, now the party's moving. That's a wonderful story. Who, who have you got with you on, uh, on your special? I know Ann Margaret. You used Ann Margaret when she Ann was... Margaret. Oh, yeah. She I was like 18 years old. Yeah, she was 18 years old when I used her. Uh, she came... I put her... I, I, I introduced Ann Margaret to the audience and she was a riot. Hmm. It was Christmas Eve. And I took, I, I, I took her to Vegas with me. Right. And when she came off the stage, she started to cry. I said, what are you crying about? She says, it's Christmas. I'd like to talk to my mother. I says, well, go in my dressing room and use my phone and charge it to me. Talk to your mother. I came into my dressing room an hour and a half later. She's still talking to her mother. <laughs> so I said to her, why don't you invite your mother to Vegas? Have her spend the day with us. She says, my mother is in Sweden. <laughs> Has you talked to your mother in Sweden for an hour and a half? She says, yes, I started to cry. <laughs> let, me, uh, I, let me let me tell you who we got him besides Ad Margaret to, the, this Friday. Kenny Rogers, Ben Vereen, Melissa Manchester, Richard Lewis, Bob Saget, Carl Reiner, Milton Brewer, Red Button, Steve Allen, and Rita Rudner. That's a great lineup. I'm on too. Oh, you're on too? Oh, yeah. Good. Good. Friday night. Now, before you leave, every time you come on here, yeah. we never let you get off stage without singing a song. You wouldn't let me sing. Huh? One step. Take one step. That's four. Ah, more is slipping. Okay. Okay. Morty Jacobs, my piano player. Let's go again. Okay. Don't you realize we're living today? I'm happy to say, in the good old, bad old days. Taking the breaks, making mistakes, in the good old, bad old ways. Some people say they long for the old days to take them way back when. But I'd rather stay right here with the gold days than go through that again. Seems to me you're either out or you're in. You lose a win in these sad old glad old days. 
You're poor or you're rich, who knows which is which anyways? We're living on time, we're having to borrow. No one knows that we will live to see tomorrow. Nevertheless, I guess we gotta confess, these are the good old, bad old days. Day by day you're either up or you're down, king or clown. Good old, bad old days. It's heaven or hell, hail or farewell, a good old, bad old day. I used to dance it, but I, I sold it to Gregory Hines. To realize, come rain and come shine, they yours, they're mine, in these crazy, mad old days. And if they play in my key, I'll wait for the curtain to raise. I'll sing all my songs, put on my makeup, right until the day that I forget to wake up. I'm happy to say, I'm living today in these good old, these bad old, in these good old, bad old days. Thank you, George Burns, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back.